So you, you need to, I'm going to tell you what you need to know for your quiz uh, next week. So you need to know that the combo is a PA projection. Um, you guys are going to have to know your mid sagittal planes and your mid coronal planes, whether they're perpendicular or parallel to the image receptor. So for this one, number three, your mid sagittal plane is perpendicular to the eye. Number four, you put the patient's head and nose against the grid. And number five, this will create the baseline all around, and it will be perpendicular to the IR. So if you think about it, if you put your head on the forehead and nose, it, it makes your OML perpendicular. The centering you need to know it's 15 degrees caudal and it's angled to the nasion. Note 7 and 8, the two notes, if you use a 0 degree beam angle with the OML, the petrous ridges will fill up the orbit. Okay, sometimes they refer to that as an exact PA skull. Number eight is even more important. I see it on the letter, right? The straight strap. If you angle the beam 25 degrees using the OML, the petrous ridges would be just below the level of the orbit. All right, there's part angulation method. That just means that you're angling the part. You're not moving the OML and you're not angling the beam. So you're just angling the part. So to do this, number three, place the patient's head so that the nose is resting on the IR and the forehead and the chin are equidistant. So the beam would then be perpendicular. Okay, quality checks. Okay. On all these images, projections, you guys are gonna need to know correct baseline beam relationship. Wherever you see that, that just means that did I use the correct baseline? Did I use the correct beam angle? Okay. So if you did, on the call well, the petrous ridges should appear in the lower one third of the orbit. Okay. If you see the petrous ridges are too high within the orbit, you didn't angle the beam enough, or the chin's too low. Okay, so I always have to do this. So petrous ridges are in the orbit. The more I put my head down, the more, the more they're gonna fill up the orbit, right? The more I put my head up, the lower they go. Okay. So if you wanna do this, that's okay. Okay, so if the petrous ridges are too low in the orbit, the beam was, was angled too much, or the chin's too high. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, rotation and tilt. Rotation, you measure from the lateral border of the orbit to the lateral margin of the skull. Rotation is this, you guys. Tilt is this. Okay, so for rotation, we go from the lateral side of the orbit to the lateral side of the skull. They should be equidistant if it wasn't rotated. Okay. For tilt, I think almost every single one of these, they tell you to look at the petrous ridges. They should be in one horizontal plane. So if they were tilted, it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like that fourth one is tilted. Yep, okay. Yep. Looks a little rotated too. Mm -hmm. Structures demonstrated for the call well, it's mainly the frontal bone that we need hold. Okay, for the AP projection, no matter for the AP projection, the only difference is the orbits appear magnified. Why is that? They're further away. Good, because of all the OIB. Good. All right, so let's go over these. Okay, so first of all, did I use the correct baseline beam relationship? You see? What, what should you look at? Okay. 
What's the quality check? From the dealer? We're about to purchase. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I did it correctly, they should be in the lower one third of the orbit. What would you say about this one? They're about halfway. So they're a little too high, aren't they? So if you went back there and did and improved it, which you wouldn't because it's not that much, but anyway, if you went back to improve it, what would you do? Angle the beam or angle the beam more or less? Less. No more. The more you angle the beam, the more you're throwing those petrous ridges down. So you'd angle the beam a little bit more, or what would you do with the chin? Raise it up a little bit. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so we already... What about rotation and tilt? Yeah, looks pretty good. I don't see any tilt and I don't see a whole lot of rotation either. Okay, anatomy. I know this is probably the hardest thing for you guys because you, anyway, you didn't actually see these. So we're gonna, we're gonna take all these images and you're gonna label them here today. I'm not going anywhere, we're gonna do it all together. Okay. All right, so this one, um, the lambdoidal suture, I don't know if you guys can see all this. It's the one kind of in the back. It's more um, triangular, I guess you can say. That's the lambdoidal suture there. This is the coronal. This little white thing sticking up, anybody know what that is? Uh, Christa Galli? Yeah, Christa Galli, it's right there. Right below this, the Christa Galli sits on what? What does it come off? The ethyl? What part of the ethyl? Herbivore plate, the horizontal portion. So, since we're looking at it like this, we can say that the cribriform plate is right here, going straight back this way. So, Christogalli, cribriform plate, what's this? You said it earlier. Perpendicular? Hmm? Perpendicular? Yeah, perpendicular plate is the vertical portion. So, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid makes up the superior part of, of the bony nasal septum which is right here. We haven't done facial bones yet, but the lower part, I think I put it in your notes. What's the lower part of the bony nasal septum? What facial bone? That's the bone marrow. Good, the bone marrow. Okay. So this is bone work here. Okay, Petrus Ridge, we already talked about, it's here. Mastoid air cells are here on the lateral aspect. The Petrus and the mastoid kind of just, in this projection, they superimpose each other because the mastoid kind of posterior to petrus. So you're just kind of looking through and through. Anytime you see light on any of these images, it's petrus because it's very, very dense. Okay, what else? Oh, what's this going vertically through the orbit? Yeah. What is the anominate line? All right, okay, so going vertically through the orbit, that's the greater wing also known as a nominal line. What's this? Some orbit. No. Well, it, yeah, it could be. It could be both of those. But this distinct line. Lesser wing? Yeah, lesser wing. Lesser wing goes horizontal through the orbit and the greater wing goes vertically through the orbit. So let's, let's talk about the orbit. So the Oh, I said it. The outer part of the orbit is called its what? Good. So this is the base of the orbit here. What do we have at the top? Okay. The superorbital margin marks the level of what? The highest level of the Good. Okay. The SOM marks the high. Wasn't that? Yeah. Well, it was SOG that we were with the glabella. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the SOM marks the highest level of the facial bones, and the SOG does what? Marks the base of the skull. Marks the base of the skull. So the SOG is directly above what? Eyeball. 
supercellular uh, arches. Okay. Then we have the SOG. What would this be? Those are the ethmoid sinuses. You could always see them in the medial part of the orbit. What's this? Yeah, these are the frontal sinuses. I would say they look like cauliflower. Looks like cauliflower. Okay. Some people don't have very big uh, frontal sinuses at all. Some people don't even have any. It doesn't look like this person has very much, and this one doesn't either. So it all, it all depends, it varies. We can see it because there's air inside or something? Yeah, okay. whenever you see a little bit darker image, it's because there's more air there, or it's thinner. If it's trauma, would you see the blood too? In the, in the frontal, no. Usually if it's a skull trauma, it's in the sphenoid sinuses that you'd see fluid or blood. We have six total. The nasal concha? Yeah. Oh, okay. yes. <laughs> nasal, nasal concha. And what do nasal concha do? Uh, filter the air and warm and filter. Warm and filter the air. Okay. Um, you guys are wondering, these are the maxillary. We haven't gotten to that yet. You, you guys are going to find, I mean, this seems really hard, and it is kind of hard at first. All the anatomy with the skull and the projections. Once we get into the fascia bones, it's the same kind of projections. It, it, it really does get easier. The only difference is we do a waters for facial bones and we don't for this, but everything else is pretty much the same. So it does get easier, I promise. Okay, over here. Did, did they use the correct baseline B relationship? Where should the petrous ridges be if they did? Where? Lower one third of the orbit. What do you think? That's pretty good. That's the lower one third. Here's the orbit coming on up here. That's the lower one third. What's this? the greater wing, the, the, the reason why it's formed that way is because it goes anterior and superior and then it go, comes back like that. Okay. What about this one? Correct baseline being relationship. That's pretty good. I need to take that off of this. But you see it's a reverse call ball, so what position is the patient in? AP. See how much bigger the orbits are compared to this? And the orbits are magnified. Okay, we already talked about that. Um, obviously, that one doesn't have the correct baseline beam relationship. So, um, where do you see the Petrus ridges? They're filling the orbits. Okay, so what would you do if you wanted to go back and make it more like a call ball. Lift the chin. Hmm? Raise the chin. Lift the chin up a little bit. Good. What would you do with the beam? Hmm? Angle it a little bit more because you want to throw those petrous ridges down a little bit. Okay. Any questions? Are all these done at 40? Mm -hmm. oh. They should be. Which image do you think gives you the better picture? The birth call ball or the it all depends. It all depends on the patient. If it's a trauma patient, obviously you have to do the AP. So, yeah. 
and I never did the, I never angled the beam, I never used the OML, I used, always used the straight PA method. There's chin and, and forehead equidistant, but the nose is level with the back and didn't angle the beam. Because anytime you angle the beam, what does it do? Does what? No. It causes distortion somehow or another. So a lot of places didn't like for you to angle the beam, especially if they're looking at the sinuses for fluid levels. So I, I never angled the beam. Maybe it's just laziness. <laughs> I just angled the patient. Okay. The next one. The next one is the AP Towns. So you need to know that the Towns is AP. Baseline, we can use the two different baselines if we want. If we use the OML, we'd angle the beam 30 degrees caudal. If you use the IOML, you angle the beam 37 caudal. Remember, what's the difference between the OML and the IOML? How much higher? 7 degrees. So that's why the difference in the beam angle. Okay. What's the difference between the Glabello meadle and the OML. What's the difference between the Glabello meadle and the IOML? Mm -hmm. There you go. Good. All right. So if, like I said, if you use OML, it's 30 degrees. You need to know that. If you use IOML, it's 37. Okay. And I put in that bold. Anytime you angle the beam, you get distortion. The more angle, the more distortion. Okay. For both the the center ray enters about two and a half inches superior to the glabella. And the next sentence you need to know, you should see the Freeman magnum in the middle of the IR. Or in the middle of the image. Okay, quality checks, correct baseline beam relationship. For this one, you should see the dorsum cell and the posterior glenoid processes within the Freeman magnum. Rotation's kind of the same like the Caldwell. You take something and you go to the lateral aspect. You take a point. So for this one, you go from the lateral sides of the foramen magnum to the lateral sides of the skull, and they should be equidistant. Okay, for tilt, kind of the same as Caldwell. Teacher's ridges should be in one horizontal plane. Structures demonstrated, not separable. All right, the next page is the reverse tone. Don't worry about it, I didn't put it on your test. The reverse tone would be a PA. And it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense because they use the OML, but they only angle 25 degrees. So it's not on your little quiz. This one I, I just magnified so you can see it a little bit better. It's not, it's not as clear here. But we can see the frame and magnum, mm -hmm. and it's in the middle of the, the uh, image. Right in the middle. The dorsum cell, it kind of looks like an angle. I don't know how to describe it. So that's the dorsum cell right here, and the posterior clinoid processes are the two little tips of the dorsum cell. So in between the dorsum cella coming up to the front, we have what? Cella tersica. Good, What sits in that cella tersica? Mm -hmm. Pituitary gland? Yeah, pituitary gland. Um, what's the front called? Mm -hmm. Tuberculum cella. And what does the tuberculum cella have on it? The anterior clinoid process. All right, the anterior clinoid process. Okay. All right, so what's this? What's this? Teacher's ridges. Teacher's ridges. 
make them, but not necessarily air cells. Um, remember the occipital bone, it, the parts of it are named for their relationship to the um, foramen magnum. Mm -hmm. So everything lateral to the foramen magnum, what is it called? Lateral condyles. Yeah, lateral condyles are the occipital bone. What about superior and posterior? The squamous portion. And everything anterior is the what? The basal portion. Okay. These are, you said it. You said it. <laughs> this, this is actually the sphenoid sinuses right in here. Follow the, the rami. Remember the rami of the mandible is the part that goes vertically. If you follow it up, you can kind of see the condyle. So the condyle of the um, mandible articulates with what? This is a little bit better here. It's coming up. I don't know if I went over it. Yeah, I think it's a TMJ thing. It forms the TMJ. So condyle of the mandible articulating with the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. Good, of the temporal bone. Where's the TMJ located? Three quarters of the fifth inch. No, it's a half inch anterior to the yeah. It's a half inch anterior to the EAM. You're thinking of the cellar point. Yeah. <laughs> three quarters of an inch anterior, three quarters of an yeah. inch superior yeah. to the EAM. I know there's a bunch of stuff, isn't there? It's different seeing it than on paper. You know? Yeah. I know. Yeah. Like teaching yourself. I know. <laughs> this is the worst semester to have to do this online. It's so detailed. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> At least you can come here. Huh? We weren't able to come here to do a lot of work. Yeah. I wish I could have got you here earlier, but it's just the way it worked out. I knew you guys would be struggling with this stuff. All right. Are we good with the towns? It's really, t I want to say towns. It's not towns. It's a town. Let me say it. Okay, lateral. Okay, you're going to see that this, the lateral position for the skull is pretty similar to, to when we get to the facial bones. It's just the centering is a little bit different. Okay, so for the lateral position, don't write this down, but a lot of times if you if you ever do a skull, which no one ever does skulls, why, why don't we do skulls anymore? CT. CT. They go straight straight to CT. We don't we don't do skulls much anymore. But usually if you did have a skull um, order, they like to do both laterals for the skull. For facial bones, they only want one. Oh, we did. We saw facial bones. Did you? Yeah. Cause she got hit by I think it was a volleyball or something. Really? Yeah. yeah. She was like a teenager. Did you do both <laughs> laterals or just one? I can't remember. Usually it's just one. But I think they only did one because she was young. They asked if they wanted both or something. Yeah. Really? They just did one projection? Well, one lateral because they didn't okay. want to like do both sides to exposed her, I guess. I think they asked if they should do both or not. Yeah, usually it's just one anyway. I mean, if you think about it, however, doing regular x-rays, doing a routine facial bones or sinuses or whatever, versus CT, that's so much radiation. I don't, I don't understand why they just go straight to CT. But anyway, that's the way it is. Okay, so for the lateral position, um, sometimes you might need a sponge because otherwise they get kind of tilted. Um, you might need a sponge to place under the head, which we're gonna do in here when we take an image. The baseline for the um, lateral position is the IOML, and the IOML is parallel to the image receptor. The interpupillary line is perpendicular to the IR. Okay, center ray is perpendicular and it enters two inches superior to the EAN. Okay, quality checks, what do I want you to know? For rotation, for rotation, you should check any vertical structure. So, 
any vertical structure. A good one are the rami of the mandible. So if I'm rotated, they're going to be off, right? Okay. And it's the opposite for tilt. For tilt in a lateral, you, you check any horizontal structure. So rotation, check any vertical structure. A good one is the first one, the, the mandibular rami. And for tilt, I do want you to know um, the orbital plates are the best for any horizontal structure. Okay, for the cross table lateral, um, for trauma, structures demonstrated, that this would be the best one to demonstrate a basilar skull fracture. So that would mean that the sphenoid sinuses have fluid in them, which is called a diffusion. Okay, so let's go over these stuff here. This is our first book. Let's look for rotation and tilt first. So for rotation, what do I look at? Mm -hmm. Ray the mandible. So any vertical structure. So you see one here and then you see one here. So there's really no rotation at all. Okay. You're always going to get one a little bit magnified because it's a little bit further away. So this is pretty good. What about tilt? Orbital plates. Orbital plates. Not bad. They're a little bit. I mean, this part is a little bit tilted because it's not like one straight line. So there's a little bit of tilt in there. Okay. Over here. It's kind of hard to see the ring behind the mandible. It's really dark. But what about tilt? Tilted. See, here's one orbital plate here, and here's another one here. It's tilted a lot. What about this one for tilt? It's okay. Right here. You didn't get down far enough to see the rotation. Okay, I'll show you this one. really tilted and really rotated. Okay. So here's one mandibular rima here, and here's another one here. I did it on purpose. And here's tilt. That's the, the oracle, the cartilaginous oracle of the ear. Okay. What's that? PAM. PAM. See how you, and you can also see how it's tilted because one EAM is here and the other one's down there. Okay. You can see the, these are sphenoid sinuses here. The sphenoid sinuses sit within what? The body. Yeah, the body of the sphenoid. See mastoid air cells. You see the coronal suture here. Kind of see lambdoidal back in here. Okay, so you see the coronal suture here. So everything anterior to the coronal suture is what bone? Good, coronal bone. Anything posterior to the coronal suture is what? Good, parietal. Anything posterior to the lambdoidal is what? There you go. Good. Here we can see the inner and outer table of the skull. This person has a pretty big coronal sinus. It's right in there. 
we'll get to this later, but this is the body of the mandible and then the rami, where the two meet, we call it the what? Good, go me. You guys probably not see it very well, but you can see a little nasal bone up here. These are um, maxillary sinuses in here. This is the orbital cavity. The orbital cavity is here. You see one eating in here. Another one I can barely see. When you could tell it's rotated by you see the two EAMs this way. So there was rotation. It's kind of hard to see because it's so dark, but here's one ray line and here's the other ray line. That's the EOP here. What does the EOP stand for? Good. External occipital protuberance which is on what bone? Good, occipital bone. And what corresponds to the inside? The IOP. The IOP, good. And there's, that looks like a um, little calcified. There's a little pineal gland inside your brain, um, and sometimes it calcifies. I don't know for sure if that's what that is, but it looks like it. Okay, then we have left. Now you guys didn't get, um, I took out the Reese position, didn't I? Mm -hmm. It's not on your stuff. Okay, good. It. They took that out of the, I think I originally had it in there, but they took it out of the ART guidelines. The Reese position was to show the orbit itself. I took it out. Okay, SMB, they call the submensural vertical projection. It's a full basal projection. So if you look at the bottom, the structures best demonstrated is the basal portion of the cranium or cranial base. Okay, this one is AP. So number one, places the patient supine or seated. Okay, the baseline that they use for this one is the IOML and it's parallel to the IR. So just imagine what we used to have to do. We had to have their head, so IOML, so we had to flip their head way back like that. It wasn't too easy to do with these old folks. So a lot of times we'd scoot their chair forward um, on the wall, from the wall bucky, and we'd tell them just to lean back until the top of their head touches the bucky. Not easy. Okay, number four, the center ray, it's a perpendicular beam and it enters a point three quarters of an inch anterior to the EAN. Okay. I want you to know the success of the SMB because a lot of times you can't get that person with their head all the way back like that. So the key to the su success is if the IOML is not parallel to the IR, the beam can be angled cephalid until it becomes perpendicular to the IOML. It'll make more sense when you go in there and I'll show you what that means. Okay, quality checks, correct baseline beam relationship. If you did it correctly, if you did everything right, the condyles of the mandible should be anterior or superior, I don't care how you say it, to the Petrus pyramids. Okay, rotation is kind of like everything else we did. You measure from the mandibular condyles to the lateral margin of the skull should be equidistant. And tilt is just like any tilt in the PA or APs, the Petrus rigus should be symmetrical. Okay, so these two, these two are SMBs. Okay, so let's look at this first one. Is this, did, did they use the correct baseline B relationship? Should we see? The what? Basilar portion? That's just overall. What? 
the SMB demonstrates. Good. The top valves of the mandible should be anterior to the petrous ridge. This is all petrous ridge, all this white stuff here. And here's the condyles of the mandible. So, like I said, you can say anterior or superior, it does, it's the same difference. Okay, so they are. So they use the Craig baseline beam relationship. What about rotation? Hmm? Just a little bit. This is a little bit further away here than it is here. So it's just a little bit rotated. What about tilt? should be in one horizontal plane for this one. Um, so we can see the foramen magnum here. You guys know what this would be? What part? The pawn? Bangs? I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think for a second. What's a pawn? <laughs> yes, it is the Dante Francis. <laughs> it is the Dante Francis. Four times. Whatever. Um, we'll get there. You're, you're, I know. My brain is mush too. Too, too much. You are the four letter word. It's always good. These are mastoid air cells here. Um, this is what part of the occipital bone? Anterior to the hmm? good. So this is the basilar area here. What's this of the occipital? Good squamous. And what's this? The lateral portion. Um, when you tilt the head way back like that, you get a good view. This, this, all this right here. This is greater wing of the sphenoid. You can kind of see the little foramens. Remember, there's three foramens on the greater wing. Mm -hmm. What are they from front to back, anterior to posterior? Rotundum, ovum, spinosa. Good. Rotundum, ovale, and spinosa. And then where the greater wing bumps up against the petrous portion of the temporal bone, we have kind of a makeshift foramen called the? Lacerum. The foramen lacerum. All right. Oh, that sounds so bad. Are you surprised you remember all that? are the ethroid sinuses that just sit you know the head way back like that within the nasal cavity these are ethroid sinuses see how they're a little bit darker these are the sphenoid sinuses here these are actually maxillary here with the teeth covering them up maxillary sinuses are kind of triangular in shape the correct baseline beam relationship. It's a little bit harder to see, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Here's the condyle here. But it looks like they did. Almost too much. This is the phantom. So I probably really rotated it back because it looks really elongated. These are the zygomatic arches. What's the label in there? Let me take an image. This is the laryngoidal suture. I don't really see the coronal suture on this one. What suture is that? Good, sagittal suture. Okay, any questions? Is cross table lateral going to be on the clue? Just that it, it would, it, it, all the centering is the same, just that it would show a basilar skull fracture. So, yes. Okay. You good? Yep. You guys want to go to the bathroom or are you good to keep going? I'm good to Okay. So we're going to take some images and then we're going to label all the images. Oh, we did two. <laughs>